so today we're going to be doing a workshop on time-lapse photography. I'm going to kind of split it in half. There's two, there's several different ways you can do time-lapse, but uh, the types of time-lapse basically are divided into daytime and nighttime. And then the nighttime is only kind of like an offshoot of daytime once you've figured out what we're, what we're going to be doing and how to set the camera for daytime. Really it's just adjusting that stuff for nighttime. So we're going to talk about daytime first. <laughs> and then uh, walk through the nighttime stuff very briefly at the end. There's also, well, there's several modes, but we're going to be discussing two modes of, of doing it. The, the quickest way that I knew to separate all the information was to kind of do like a tips thing, like the best practices kind of thing. There are a million and one uses for time lapse that can be used to enhance a film that you already have that you're working on. Uh, kind of dramatically showcase like one scene. You can pick a bird, for instance, and uh, have the background out of focus. Very few times are you going to want to have one thing in focus and everything out of focus in in time lapse. I mean, if we look at that one of the bird, for instance, it would be just as effective if we had the entire scene in focus. All right. So uh, I, I'm going to advocate for everyone to just set their apertures at a very high uh, f-stop. So that means minimum of 11, all the way up to f-22. I recommend to put 22, especially if you've got a DSLR that you're working with that's got a high ISO rating. If you're shooting in RAW, you can pretty much get rid of a lot of grain, especially if you're going to be using bulb photography or extended shutter photography. <coughs> and if you are stationary or even if you're on uh, a dolly or a, an automated uh, slider, you can get very good, very effective slow shutter photography that, that you really won't have to worry about high high and so forth. All right? So as far as the other uses, you can give your audience like a, a sort of visual representation of the passing of time. Who likes the show Breaking Bad? I should have every hand in the room. Oh, <laughs> so show is that right? <laughs> They use sliders and time lapse in almost every single episode, and they do it very effectively. They, they, they probably, I don't know if this is the case, they probably have one guy they just send out in the morning while everybody else is on production, and they have him set up a slider and spend seven or eight hours just staring at it, making sure it's getting good cloud cover. Because the next time you watch the show, I want you to, I want you to think back to this conversation, all right? Uh, and to, I mean, any episode, pretty much any episode, especially the one where everybody's high on meth, right? <laughs> like, and then you and you kind of see the party house at what's the name of uh, Pinkman's house, right? You see the party house and then the party, and all of a sudden it, it kind of fades into this. You know, the the nightscape comes. The, the stars kind of turn in front of the world and then the, the morning rises or whatever and then everybody's still awake whatever they probably had a guy hanging out overnight to shoot that while everybody else was on the production set and, and had no more than a 20 minute time frame between the morning shop sequence and the night shop sequence <coughs> nobody would have ever known because that time lapse was very effective in creating that expanse of time so the passing of time as far as that goes is perfect especially something like this I had <coughs> If I could find it, I'll show you. I had a, I think, a five minute short uh, uh, video production on the, there was a restaurant that I shot like a, a, a day or a, a night in the life of this restaurant. And in fact, the title of the, the, title of the restaurant is called On the Marsh, and the title of the video was An Evening on the Marsh. And I used time lapse in there, you know, I, I did a pan turning away from the piano player and sort of like use the, the music from the piano as a fade into this time lapse. And I would intercut, you know, people serving people and then the time lapse again. And then, you know, people eating and then time lapse again. And it's just a very effective use of kind of the sort of things you can use for time lapse. Right.
actually what cartoons are. Everybody knows that, yes? Kind of. And even if they haven't, didn't know it, they could probably assume so. In fact, that's where uh, Time Lapse Photography was born. The, you know, it's basically nothing more than subtly changing the scene, uh, captured frame by frame until the desired movement is, is created. You can speed that up and slow it down based on a mathematical formula that I will teach you <coughs> today. So what you will need, you will need an intervalometer, a calculator, the formula, the mathematical formula that I'll give you today, pen and paper, very important, and some kind of a stabilizer. Now, it doesn't have to be stable because you could use an automated slider like the one with the little melting popsicle. Another great way to stabilize the camera and add some dynamic movement to your shot is to use an automated slider. This will move the camera along a set of rails in increments so that each shot is slightly different from the one before it. In the end, it'll look like you're fluidly pushing into a shot or pulling out of it, or it can even look like you're moving along the horizon. This Cinetic Cinemoco motorized slider will let you program a camera dolly to slide in increments along a set of rails while it fires the camera remotely. It took me some time with the instruction manual and online tutorials to figure it all out, but once I did, I was able to program the shot interval and the distance the dolly will travel down the tracks. The Cinemoco takes a still, moves whatever distance you choose, and takes another shot. It's called SMS in the menu, which stands for Shot Move Shot. You can also set it to slide continuously while it fires the shutter. It also allows you to program things like exposure, the direction you want the wheels to travel in, and so on. Uh, but tripods, you know, uh, there's also automated ones. I think there's called a Tripod Genie, and at times syncs up with the camera at times, like hand shots, very basic sort of hand shots, but you can do panoramic and things like that with it. What you should have uh, include something that moves steadily, all right? The best, the best and most successful or most aesthetically successful time-lapse photography comes from things that have a, a, con a continual movement rate on a very, very slow scale. Things like fungus growing on the forest floor, flowers blossoming, all right? Sunset, sunrises, that's, that's great and very easy to do. The longer that slow continuum, though, the better, because that'll give you like this just beautiful, epic movement that everybody kind of knows happens, but nobody's gonna stand around and watch a flower bloom. And even if they did, they're not going to get the same effect from that as would they speeding that up. All right, so and obviously you're going to need a, a camera <laughs> and uh, preferably one that can shoot raw, okay? Any of the cameras that we have here at the gear locker are gonna have the capability <coughs> Shoot raw, you can get away with JPEG, but I'll, I'll discuss why raw is better as we move on. If you have the option of having a camera that's got manual settings, don't ever use the auto. Don't ever use the auto when you're doing time lapse, and I'll discuss why that's a huge no-no. And finally, a good plan, all right? You need to go out a day before, uh, before you do your time lapse. You need to find out what the weather's gonna be like, uh, and you can find out the environmental aspects of your shot, sequence, and things like that, okay? So, moving on. Okay. As I said, there are two modes of shooting uh, time-lapse. Now, this right here, the intervalometer that you see here, <coughs> is big and kind of clunky, but the reason for that is it's connected to a moving tripod. I'll show you a video piece, a piece of a video. VNH, by the way, has some really good and edu good educational training videos. They're not terribly in depth, but topically they do a great job of introducing you to various uh, things. And most of them involve gear or specific types of photography and things like that. In any case, this intervalometer is connected to thing that you can't see here, which is, it's just it's a little kind of three-leg tripod that sits right on the, on the bars of a slider, and it just kind of moves subtly every so many seconds as coordinated between here and the camera and the legs themselves. So 
that's the benefit of actually paying out twelve hundred to five thousand dollars for something that's going to give you an amazing sort of thing. On the other <coughs> hand, if all you want to do is have a tripod sitting there with something very basic, this is an intervalometer that you're more, more likely going to pick up. I bought one for it was in Asia. Price was. You can pick these up. Cheap ones range from 40 bucks all the way up to uh, probably 100, 150, and they're not really expensive. And they basically do all the same stuff, so you can get away with the cheap. All right. Mine is crazy basic. It's digital, so really it's just there's a dial here and a button in the middle that says set. And basically the, men the menu is pretty basic. I'll, I'll, I'll show you a video of what that will look like, kind of on a bigger scale. But this one will basically uh, it'll ask you. The interval, which is the distance of time between shots and the time itself. And what that will do is calculate how many shots and how long that shot sequence is going to take. And we'll get into more of the math of that when we talk about the formula. But basically put, if you want 20, 20 minutes of a sunset, you have to know how many frames per second your, your, your end result is going to be. So if you're shooting for video, 24, 25 frames per second is fine. If you're shooting for the internet, you need to shoot at 30, 30 frames per second. So you take that number, you put it into the formula that I'm about to discuss, and then out come your interval uh, equation, like that, that portion of the equation. All right, so you can shoot in interval only. If I want my camera to shoot in interval only, I can cancel the time and just put it on every three seconds. If I'm shooting clouds or something, just I'll put it on every three seconds, Constant exposure, no changes in the camera, set. And as soon as I hit the set button, it'll just go click, 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 until you either run out of battery, until you run out of card space, or until you yourself stop that sequence from happening. All right, that's the easiest way. And I introduced that one first because that's not the one we're going to be doing. All right? If you just show up one day and you can't afford for one reason or another to come out the next day and plan well, and all you want to do is set your tripod down and shoot the cloud, get your correct exposure, and set it going. No problem. On the other hand, um, you can shoot in true time lapse mode. Now, true time lapse mode, for all intents and purposes, is going to be something that offers you more in depth uh, options, but it's going to require that, that, that more planning, as we were saying. So it's, it's more work, but your final product will definitely be more appealing, and you'll have more control over the appeal of that final field. So that's the one, uh, that's the one I recommend, and that's the one we're gonna discuss. So the key to good time lapse, as I mentioned before, is planning. Uh, more than likely, your time lapse subject is gonna be outside, or it's gonna take place outside of a window. There's not, a, and the reason for that is there's not a whole lot of movement inside. Steady, progressive movement takes space, right? Large amounts of space. So more than likely that's gonna be outside. Deshaun's project actually took place on, or inside of a car, looking out the front window, right? If you guys recall his little video sequence, which is fine, but if he had planned a little better, we would have seen a better project. So let's see. Uh, the reason that weather comes into play, therefore, is because your subjects are going to be outside. Uh, it's, it's where the, the abundance of your light is going to be coming from, and it's also because it's outside, you're going to have some unique uh, challenges. The light changes quite frequently as clouds move in and move out. The clouds themselves might be part of your subject. Okay, so all of those things come into play and, and add unique and uh, interesting challenges. So planning a day ahead is going to be your best shot for success. Ultimately, when, when you think about it, you only have one shot to get it right. right. You can't go back in time and make the sun go back. You have to go out the next day. If, if you get it wrong, basically, you're just gonna, you're kind of screwed. So uh, that's why you go out a day in advance and get all that stuff taken care of. All right, so let's say your goal is to shoot 20 minutes, 20 minutes of a sunset, as I was kind of talking about before. <laughs> The day before you plan to shoot your time lapse, what you need to do is go to the location itself that you want to shoot at. Go off the side of a bluff or down to the, your favorite pier or 
basically any place that's got a sunset, you know, a view or access to a sunset. You need to bring the paper and pen with you, and you also need to bring your camera with you at this time, okay? Uh, what you're going to do when you show up is you're going to take a couple of shots of, of the actual area you want to frame. You're going to frame your shot with the camera. That means your tripod sitting there kind of exactly the way you want it or envision having it the next day. You're going to take pictures of the actual location. All right. Now, why would you take pictures of the location, you ask? Good question. Rain, if wind blows, how close are you to the cliff? Uh, what kind of dangers are there? Is, there? is there like a fox burrow right next to you and you didn't notice it when you were there the first time? You know what I mean? Like you just, you'll want to snap a bunch of pictures of the environment in which you plan on having your, your camera. You're also going to want to set the camera up and take a picture of the camera itself on the tripod. Right? Because when you go back the next day, you're like, oh, I see the little divots where my tripod was. I can put it right there again. <coughs> All kinds of neat little things come up when you uh, plan ahead. And the reason you're going to bring your uh, paper and pen is for the formula. You're going to time. You're going to actually want to be there at the time when you're going to be shooting your time lapse. All right. So you show up half an hour before you think the sun's going to go down, or that 20-minute expanse when the sun is going to go down, and you're going to stay there probably <coughs> another 20 minutes to half an hour afterward. All right. So plan at least an hour and two hours. This is going to be this is going to be paramount because when you show up, basically all you'll have to do is show up. 20 minutes, pick up your stuff and leave. Right? You're saving yourself a heck of a lot of time and frustration the next day. All right, so let's talk about frames per second. The normal FPS or frames per second for television is 24 uh, for video uh, that goes on television. It's 25. Cinematic, uh, film, when you go to the theater, it's 24, 25 frames per second, T uh, TV and cinematic. Uh, I always recommend that you shoot at least at 30 because, well, there's several factors and several of you probably are already kind of nodding your head and saying, yeah, I don't One of the reasons is that you, you can go down to 24, 25 frames per second, but you can't really go up. Digitally speaking, you can go up to 30, but it's going to be choppy and funky and it's not going to look like what you want. Get more frames, right? You're not going to be able to go in later and fill those with other frames. It's, it's possible, but the likelihood of you actually doing that close to yeah. nil. You can also shoot at 60 frames per second, which when you when we think about shooting a normal video at 60 frames per second, what what would we apply that to? Anybody? Something super fast. <laughs> Something that's super fast. <clears throat> if you're filming, say, a car race, and this thing is coming at you at the Indy 500. <laughs> At 120 miles an hour around a turn, right? You're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna see that tiny little smoke that kicks out under the tires as the tires peel and the and the car kind of fishtails, right? I mean that's and you can you can take all those 60 frames and slow those down to a, an amazing, almost seamless or probably seamless to the eye kind of motion that really gives you an amazing, you see the road grip kicking off. Do you know what I mean? Like you can really get some good stuff out of that 60 frames per second or even 120 at that, at that point. If you're paid to film at the Indy 500, you can definitely afford a red and go out there 120 frames a, a bra per second. But uh, it's different when we're talking about time lapse. Okay? We, we still can get that detail. And we can speed up the interval to do basically whatever we want, especially if we're talking about 120 or 60 frames a second. But it doesn't necessarily mean we want to speed something up. In fact, it's just the opposite. In time lapse, the reason we would shoot more than 30 frames a second is we wanted to slow it down even more. So let's say we've got, and that's called ramping, by the way. In in a shot sequence in time lapse, you you. Let's say that the clouds are kind of coming up over this mountain and roiling around as it hits the warmer, moister air over here. It just kind of like keeps it in one little spot. Well, if you're only going to have a two second split of intercut of that shot between something else, something else is happening and you want to just, you know, maybe the music is hitting a crescendo and then pauses and then moves on to something else in a music video or whatever. Well, or say you're shooting a commercial. Well, what you'll want to do is speed up that royal and then kind of slow it down just, just 
instantaneously yet still slow, uh, show some very slow movement. To have both the fast and the slow together, you'll need to clip some of those frames and add some of those frames in, so to speak, in post production. I'm not talking about the computer shooting. All right, does everybody understand it? It just gives you more options, essentially. I mean, you can, you can I use a thousand and one different examples, but that's basically uh, the reason that you would shoot more than 30 frames per second. But shooting 30 is fine. I would just keep it at the minimum of 30. It's kind of like your standard.
the lighting conditions are going to change regardless where you're at. If you're doing time lapse and it's outdoors, more than likely, unless there's some artificial light source, those conditions are going to change. If they if they change a minimal amount, it's not a big deal. But if you're shooting a sunset where it's going to get darker as time goes on, you're going to want to choose what they call aperture priority. Okay, aperture priority locks you in. Uh, for your f-stop, allowing allowing for your iris to to stay at the same place. However, your shutter speed will change. All right, your aperture priority is important. Why? Anybody know? Why wouldn't you be shutter, shutter priority? Why wouldn't you set your shutter? Because you want your shutter to remain the same, probably, and you want your aperture to be able to adjust due to. I mean, for a sunset, like changing light conditions. So once it gets darker, you're going to want to open the eye up. Sure. So what aperture priority means is that if you put aperture priority on your camera, which is usually an A, on mine it's just A. Uh, there's S for shutter, there's P for program, and there's M for manual. So if I set my aperture to F11 and set it to aperture priority A, then it's going to lock that in and everything else is going to adapt. So some cameras will allow the ISO to go up and down to adapt for light changes and but the point of, of setting aperture priority is for the shutter to change all right so the shutter is going to open up and close for longer periods of time or shorter periods of time based on the changing lighting conditions now the reason that you're going to want to keep it on aperture priority is to remain in a better focus that's the whole point if you're trying to get the entire scene in focus and you've set your focus and you've set your aperture priority, you've got that covered. So your, your depth of field is determined by your aperture, correct? Everybody knows that? So you set your focus, you've set your aperture, and let's say someone walks in front of the screen. You're on a beach, right? Your aperture, if it wasn't set to aperture priority, might adapt to, say, F4, because they block the light out at just the right time, right before the shutter trips, and all of a sudden you've got a shallow depth of field for one or two frames, right? So that's, that's, not, that's not keeping with the continuum of the other shots. So aperture priority is something you're gonna do for constantly and, and rapidly changing lighting conditions. All right, number three, have something that doesn't move or that moves much more slowly than the rest of the scene in the foreground, all right? Keep something interesting in the foreground. That's kind of a key to all photography anyway, is to have your, your shot is going to be divided up into three. If it's a landscape shot, you're going to have a foreground, a mid-ground, and the background. All right? Have something interesting in each of them, but in the foreground of your time lapse, have something unmoving. All right? A bird perched on a rock looking around for fish. Or, you know, a kid playing in the sand. Or, I mean, human, uh, you know, uh, the human eye looks for other humans, right? So we can put a human in there somewhere. Even if you have to stage something, if there's nothing but sand and there's no, like, crabs making homes somewhere or something else going on in the sand, put something else there. All right? Walk down the beach 20 feet and put something else in the shot in the foreground. Number four, gradual movement creates the best motion. That's kind of a no-brainer we already talked about. That cloud blowing across the sky, sun setting, flowers blossoming, fungus growing on the forest floor. The longer the sequence, the better. Number five, shoot in manual focus. Turn off your autofocus. I'm gonna say that twice. Turn off your autofocus. Turn it off. That guy that walks in front and blocks you and changes up your aperture <coughs> is okay sometimes, but him changing the focus is not going to, right? Okay, it's like, that was horrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I think that's how you would say not very good. No, it's as bueno. <laughs> that's not good? No. It's muy malo. There it is. It's Spanish. Yes. Back to high school. So, uh, but obviously, before you get your manual focus turned off, focus now. Get your focus. If you can, if you can focus via your eyes, which might still be working in your twenties, then great. If not, uh, 
half trip your shutter button, uh, and it'll, it'll give you that beep once you focus on whatever you're. And you, you can also spot or meter it and, and focus on one thing in specific. Uh, one really, really good trick that I learned when I was in my journalism days is you can set your camera to 2 8, f2.8, get your focus on, on the point of reference that you want, and then open up the depth of field by flipping it back to manual and opening up the aperture to f11 or higher. Okay? That's going to open up that depth of field and give you that entirety of the scene. Number six, frame your subject for the movement that's going to be happening. Remember that, for the movement. Where are the clouds going? Don't point your camera here if the clouds are going there, right? Frame it so that everything walks into the frame and is aesthetically very pleasing, all right? If you want your picture to be creative and but really annoying and, and you know, to, to, to be off-putting to the viewer, then have stuff look uncomfortable and kind of leaving the frame. That's fine, if that's your intention, but you know, nobody's going to walk up and tell you how to shoot your time lapse, and how, how the, the feel that you want for your time lapse. But aesthetically, you know, people are going to prefer that stuff kind of enters into the frame. So give that movement enough place in the frame to be comfortable. Number seven. Are we on seven? <laughs> Setting your shutter speed to one fortieth or one fiftieth of a second is going to give you the best quality for a realistic look. 140th to a 150th. If you're not set on aperture priority, try to lock that one down at 140th or 150th of a second. Right? And that's a general rule. That's not, if you're wanting low light movement, go, go lower. Go, you know, go much slower. Cut that in half, 60th of a second. You know, lower than a 60th of a second is fine if, if you want that look. If you like set up at, uh, Time, Time Square or Union Station, right? Just point it down into the crowd. You're going to want people making like tracers throughout the crowd, which looks awesome. Go for 30th of a second, 10th of a second, depending on how fast people are walking. Number eight, shooting raw. Why shooting raw? Because adjustments in exposure are much, much easier in posts. If you don't have your exposure nailed in, tack sharp, right on point, you don't have like one of those $800 you know, viewfinder meters, uh, shoot them raw, that'll give you a lot of freedom in, in post when you adjust for your exposure. <laughs> uh, number nine, if you have to choose between underexposing and overexposing, always underexpose. If you overexpose, it's gone. It's way off the top mm -hmm. of your histogram and it, you cannot retrieve it. All right. If it's below the top of your Instagram, it could be pulled up in some way in post. Number 10, disable your auto power off function. If your camera turns off after a certain amount of time, turn that off. It, it probably won't recognize that your camera's hooked up to the intervalometer. Okay? Number 10, lock your camera up. Lock your mirror up. If you have the option to keep your, your mirror locked up, do that. And the, almost all DSLRs have this. You can kind of have to fumble through the menu to find it. But when you lock it up, it's generally for cleaning. So that when, when you've when you're got your little lens pen or whatever, you're cleaning it. Uh, lock it up. It, it does use a little bit more battery, but it stabilizes the camera. You don't have that internal vibration. and. Uh, what it'll also do is make sure that every frame is just tack sharp still on your focus. That, that image, the, the light is constantly hitting your, your center. All right, which has a, an added caveat. If you lock your camera up, be mindful that this lens effectively is what? It's a magnifying glass, right? If you're pointing out at the sun, you better bet that the sun is burning your, your center. <laughs> Keep that in mind when you're locking your sensor up. Don't point it directly at the sun. Uh, where are we at? 12. The best time lapse photography has the widest depth of field. So set your aperture between, as I said, 11 and 22. Number 13, for longer excuse me, time lapse requirements, if you have the option of plugging your camera to a, a, a continuous power supply, do that. Still have a battery in there, but if there's a power source nearby 
and your camera does actually have a pop up power supply. You click on it, plug that in. Just to make sure. Uh, 14, uh, second most important, set your shot formula to provide your final video with enough before and after frames for fading into the sequence, fading out of the sequence, and also for correcting some kind of errors. All right? Does everybody know what I mean by that? I don't need to walk right through that one. Who doesn't understand what I mean by that? Is that a little fuzzy? Everybody's got that? All right, and lastly, pick something interesting. Most importantly, all of this is worthless if you have a picture of a wall, right? What is that? You're waiting for a bug to crawl on it or something? I mean, like, make it interesting. Put something interesting in the foreground, make it in the background. All right. All right, let's talk about your, the formula. Basic formula is interval equals seconds divided by frames. Anybody here like a math frame? Yeah. All right, we got one, so it's worth talking about. I did the best I could. <laughs> Laugh at me in private, okay? Okay. All right. So the formula is interval equals seconds divided by frames. Damn, it's bright. It's so much brighter than the other one. So I just used my own little letters here. And for that, and that reason alone, I recommend you using the same. <laughs> right. So G uh, is the goal of, of, of your final video, like the time. How long do you actually want your video to be? In time lapse, we're talking about seconds, okay? If you want several minutes, we're talking about thousands of frames based on the frames per second, okay? So 10 seconds is pretty applicable if you're talking about just intercutting between some other video. Most times, nobody's ever gonna watch an entire movie of nothing but time lapse, all right? Not unless you're a Nat Geo stoner. <laughs> all right, T equals the time of the event. T meaning 20 minutes of a sunset. That's the time that you're standing in front of that sunset. That's T. All right, so F is gonna be your goal, all right? So uh, frames per second goal. So if you want 30 frames per second, 25 frames per second, that's, but that's, that's, that's how it's going to be used later on. As I stated, I recommend 30. X always equals 60. Why? Because there's 60 seconds in a minute, okay? S. Uh, S is the final second count, not number two, but the seconds, the count, the number of seconds after uh, the equation. So after you have figured out the equation here, uh, your seconds down here. P is the number of frames in the sequence, the actual number that you're going to get the answer. And then Z is your final interval. So Z is kind of what you're trying to go for. You're trying to get, um, you're trying to get Z. Uh, Z will be the number of frames. So uh, let's just say for our purposes, we have what we want. Uh, final goal is 10, uh, we want a 10 second video. Now that can change, we can, our, our main project, we can figure out all of the information, shoot it, and then set our cameras to interval as soon as that ends and get that back end, you know, 20 frames, or that front end 20 frames, right? Our, uh, the time of the event, we'll say is a 20 minute sunset. Uh, our F is gonna be 24 frames per second. We'll just say this uh, for today's purposes. And uh, x always equaling 60 gives us our equation. So if our goal times uh, the frames, so let's say uh, 10, so the goal is a uh, uh, 10 second video at 24 frames per second. 10 times 24 is 240, and that's 24 frames per second. No, 240 frames, I'm sorry. Uh, and then we take the time of the event with that. Is that 24 frames per second, is that standard? It's standard. Or does that depend on your camera, or? In time lapse, you determine all that. Stand oh, okay, so that's what you're actually setting? Yeah, well, you're creating 24 frames per second. Okay, so you would make that decision mm -hmm. up front. Yeah. I would never do this. Uh, mine would be 300 frames, because I would always shoot at 30 frames per second. All right? So, but just for discussion purposes, we'll say uh, we're going to have a, a video that goes on TV and it's never going to be used anywhere else. All right. So the T, the time of the event times the uh, 
always 60. So time of the event, which is uh, 20 minutes, what do we say, 20 minutes times 60 seconds is 1,200 seconds. So for 1,200 seconds, you can divide that number of frames. 1,200 divided by 240 frames equals five. All right, that is what? What is five? What are we gonna do with five? Shot sequence initiation time. Sounds very military, doesn't it? Right? That's when you, you hit that button at 7.25 and 30 seconds. You time it down to the second. Because then you know, you know, I mean, the, the, the sun kind of goes down a little bit more each day or is there a course of the year. But it's not going to be that dramatically different one day prior, right? So that is why you prep the day before. That's why you do all that stuff. Once you've found your location, use your camera's metering function to uh, set your exposure setting. And you're also going to write that exposure setting down. All right? Write your exposure setting onto the pad, right underneath your uh, formula, down to five seconds, starting at this time, ending at this time, and then right below that, you write your exposure settings. Does everybody know what your metering is when I say that on your camera? I got two people to know. All right, in the front of your camera, there's a little bulb, all right? And if you'll notice, if I have my camera set to autofocus, it will send out a little, oh, 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 oh. it'll send out, okay. Everybody ever see that little light there? It sends out a little beam of light that bounces back into the lens and determines how far your subject is. You set your camera to 2.8, you find your point of focus, and you get that focus. You write it down, it's gonna, it's gonna give you, at that point of focus, it's gonna tell you, okay, you're gonna need to shoot at an F, let's say it doesn't give you F11, let's say it gives you F4 at 500 of a second, ISO, whatever, all right? You're going to, you're gonna change that Justin, everybody know what, what your uh, your uh, exposure triangle is? You should know. You better know. Exposure triangle. You have three. It's like, uh, you have three options on your exposure triangle. You better know this. I forget. ISO, shutter speed, F. Okay. Oh. All right. So let's say you want F11, but on your on your exposure triangle. The f stop, the aperture has come in, so you're going to need to bring that out, which means that some of the other ones need to be adjusted to equal that original exposure. All right. So from f4 to f11, you got to figure out how many stops that is. How many stops of light is it from f4 to f11? Also, there's f4 to what is it? F5, 6 to f8, uh, and then 11 is going to be a third stop. So you're going to adjust your aperture up or down three stops. Mathematically, that will equal out the correct exposure. Another very good reason to have your notepad on, right? It's going to give you all of that stuff. If you, some cameras 
have thought ahead for those of us who don't do well at setting our exposure, and we can set it on average or priority, mark it up to F11, and then get your exposure, and it'll give you exactly what you need. All right. So, write all that stuff down, get your best light, make sure there's a good subject. If, you, if your scene the night before is lacking in subject matter, bring somebody, somebody or something with you. Yourself and your dog, walk along the beach really, really slowly, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Like your dog just like, doesn't know what's going on, doesn't care, he's just gonna be sniffing at crabs all the whole time. You know? like, so, so plan for your subject matter as well. Once you think you have the best light for your subject, write all this stuff down. Also, write down your framing possibilities, all right? Take your camera, as it sits on the tripod, and say, uh, click kind of a panorama of, of the scene. You, you're not just limited to one scene. Zoom in, zoom out, kind of frame in and frame out. See, maybe, maybe, a, maybe a, a telephoto is better than a wide angle lens for this particular scene. Write all that stuff down. Just write your thoughts down as you're there. If you don't have two days and absolutely must go without sort of a pre-planned schedule, plan to show up early and stay late to ensure that you're taking advantage of all the available light. Uh, if you are shooting overnight, uh, we're, we're transitioning into the night shooting. Uh, it's, it's kind of a different story, but it's based on the same stuff. All right. To show movement in your time lapse, this is going to require you to open up your shutter a little bit more. Everybody knows what I mean when I say that? Right? Opening up your shutter means it's capturing more light. So if somebody's walking by, and if you've got a full second, they're gonna, it's going to open up and, and record all of what happens and burn that onto the sensor for that full second. <laughs> yeah, it's neat to do, it's tough to do, but it can be done, and messing with it prior to your actual shooting time is going to be beneficial to you. Because maybe, you know, maybe if you don't have a, an ability to go the night before and test out what that's going to look like, you know, um, it, would be, it would be good to show up early and kind of make those changes. The reason that I'm kind of ending on uh, talking about the shutter for, for daytime photography is that this is going to be taken to the extreme on overnight photography. All right, so we're done talking about daytime photography. Nighttime uh, time lapse is a, a whole, it's a different level of patience. You have to be around your camera for this part. You shouldn't leave your camera anyway, but for this part, you're gonna make, you need to make sure that your, your settings are gonna be a little different. Now, your, your shutter is the one that's gonna need to be on priority for overnight photography. You can kind of adapt this. Let's say you're on a, a five second interval on overnight photography for 20 minutes watching those stars sort of move subtly, right? Your, sh your shutter is going to be open for probably two, two of those seconds, which means you're going to want to actually cancel one of those rules in the, in the 15 top 15 tips that I gave you, and that is to turn your preview on, all right? With your preview on, you'll be able to see that that is either well exposed or not well exposed. Like a, a three second exposure takes in a lot of light, especially if you've got the ISO cranked up. You should have no problem shooting it in F. I mean, if you're, if you're shooting for stars, it really kind of wouldn't matter because you could focus out to infinity and have everything available to you. So aperture, you have a little bit of freedom at night to open that, open that up a little bit. Yeah, having, having, that, having that display, having the preview mode on is gonna help you a lot. Um, there are other unique challenges to night photography. Remember, nocturnal animals will be about uh, this time of year, snow is probably more likely. Inclement weather is more likely at night, things like that. So if you're gonna be doing that stuff, going out the day before will also say, uh, having, having your uh, tablet or phone with you to have an app for the weather is gonna be pretty key. It seems kind of uh, simple, but really get an app and, and know what the weather's gonna be hour by hour. All right, so that's basically all of it. Um, I could spend more time talking about night shots, but that's, that's the very topical introduction to, to the night timelines. If you guys have uh, questions about that, I'll, I'll post some of this stuff online and let me know uh, if you guys go and try this out. Let me know what you think about it and how it works out. I, I can also accompany you uh, for, for various things, preferably on the weekends, not during the week.
but it would be kind of cool to maybe have a group go out and do some night stuff maybe as it gets a little warmer. Uh, let's see, once you have all your images on the camera, you know, what you'll want to do is quickly review those. There's going to be a lot of them, a minimum of 240 all the way up to you know, 1,000 images, depending on how long you're going to be shooting for. Look through them. Spend the time to look through them. Oh, one thing I, for some strange reason, did not put on my top 15, have a huge memory card. All right, 64 gigs, huge. If you're shooting raw, 64 gigs is basic. So my camera shoots at 36 megapixels, which is quite a bit more than you're, you're ever gonna deal with with the cameras that we have to give you in the gear locker. But let's say there, there's uh, about, I think the megapixels on the camera suit we have here are like 12, 12 megapixels, right? So it's a third of what I'm shooting with. But what I, what I will get if I go out and shoot raw is something like 220 images every 16 gigabytes. So if I multiply that by two to 32 gigs, I'm looking at 400 images. So I'm gonna need a minimum of, of a 32 gig card just to get what we're talking about right now. All right? If I'm shooting for a 40 minute sequence just to make sure I've got the right stuff, then, then I'm talking about a 64 gig card, twice that, twice that 32 gig capacity. All right, so plan ahead on that one. All right, once you have all your images on the camera, review them. Uh, make sure that they appear the way you want them, uh, you know, to bring back to the editing station. Now, the bad news is there's not a whole lot you can do about it if they don't look the way you want. Not there, anyway. You're going to bring those back to the editing station, and I suggest you do batch edits. Everybody know what a batch edit is in software? Who doesn't know what batch edits are? Okay. Batch edits are, if you use software like Premiere, Lightroom, uh, Adobe Bridge, ACDC, all of these, they, they have the capacity to take an entire, not, full, uh, not one image, but an entire folder of images and do uh, the same edits to each one of them. All right, so for time lapse, what you don't want to do is edit half of them for really good light, the other half, ah, that, that doesn't look good that way, I'm going to change this and do that. Once you've done your batch edits and you have bypassed that noticeable shift in your settings that throw off your final render, save your images as JPEGs in the highest resolution possible. Obviously, you're going to be sh more than likely shooting in a landscape and not a portrait. Right? You're going to be shooting with your camera like this, not at your tripod. That said, in post, what, you, what you're going to probably need to do is, in, while batch editing, you can crop them down to the frame that you're going to be working with on your video editing software. So that would be 1280 by 720, or uh, 1440 by, what is it, 19, 1440 by 1920, something like that. It depends on, on what your final render is going to look like. If you're working with 1080, uh, just figure out what those, uh, what that resolution or that uh, aspect ratio is going to be and edit, uh, batch, crop all of your images from the very center of that image. And if you guys want to actually do that and see what that looks like, we can do that as well. All right. Uh, once you finish editing the, editing the images, uh, open up your video editing software and you'll need to open up the import panel. Okay, so not, you don't want to just click and drag somewhere because the import option for a lot of the software that you're going to use for making the video actually will create the video automatically for you. Um, when you click the import, this action will uh, create a file that you choose. My camera. Actually, not only does it have an internal intervalometer, it has it has an intervalometer as well as a true time lapse option on it. So normally on your camera function, not the tools or the pencil or anything like that, the camera function, you're going to have what they call time lapse or interval shooting. Now, if I wanted to just set the interval, I'd go in. So if I go down to sets, you get 300 at. So 300 times 2, which is a total of 600 images, 1,200 images, uh, 4, 900 images, uh, 3 sets of those. All right, it's asking me how many videos I want to make. The reason that it's asking me that, which is not what an option is on the intervalometer, is because this will, this camera actually is the, the minute, the second that the last image, the last frame is put through the processor, it'll make that video. 
that will process an MOB file for me of the frame rate that I want, which is amazing. That means I don't have to bring myself my all my images into an import software and then you know set the frames per second on the software, do all that stuff, and then render it. It'll create it right in the camera, which is why it's like five grand. All right. So I'm gonna see if I can walk this around. So now that we have time-lapse option available to us here, everybody can see that. Uh, now you'll see that I do have that length of time available there. So I can shoot at, it also geotags it. And it's asking me what my, my frame rate's gonna be. So I've got uh, the, the resolution, which is gonna be 1080 at 30 frames per second. It asked me right here, and I can change that by going down. Um, the interval sets here at one second, and I can set that up to one every five hours. If I um, the, the entirety of the time, which is seven minutes, it's going to go and calculate all that stuff for me, whether or not I change it. And then as soon as I click OK, it starts shooting. Or it waits until the time that I tell it to start shooting in say five minutes or ten minutes. All right, so that, um, my camera's kind of preset for all that stuff. So really quickly, depending on what you use, I'm gonna talk about Premiere and Sony Vegas. In Premiere, to import your files, presuming they've all been edited to your satisfaction, you're gonna click File, Import, and then you're gonna browse to the folder where your JPEGs exist, and then you're gonna click, um, actually you're gonna select the checkbox that says, uh, image sequence and Premiere has a really cool little thing it's, it's kind of asking you do you want to make a movie out of this and if that's what it knows your settings are already and if you're okay with that you click that little checkbox button and it will make that movie for you which is great in Sony Vegas which is the PC version of what most kind of like TV, mobile documentary filmmakers are like myself you're gonna set you're going to need to set your default image time, and so you're going to need a little bit more math for that. So you go to Options, Preferences, select the Editing tab once that window opens, and under the New Still Image Length Information option box, you're going to highlight and change the numbers. So if it's defaulted at 5 seconds, you're going to change that to 0 .033 seconds. I recommend, once you have all that stuff done, I recommend editing and rendering your draft at, at that rate. Okay. Because uh, what's going to happen later is, let's see, um, if, if you need to change your FPS later, your frames per second later, and so you, know, you get that ramping down or ramping up option that you want to slow or down or speed up the clouds, you can edit accordingly. Once you've got that rendered video, you can use it as a pre-render and just select, splice into a certain segment of it and expand it out or shrink it down to speed it up and slow it down instead of going to the images individually and expanding them. All right, so for the best results in preparing your time-lapse video, set your ed editing software to XDCAM, the XDCAM format. So everybody know what XDCAM is? It's a very, very heavy MP4 file. It's, it's, it's the least compressed of all of the, the options that most uh, renders have available. So I think 422 and stuff that's prepped for raw imaging, like you know, the red editing software and stuff like that, they do a better job, but if you, should, if you edit with the XDCAM option, you can, you can from that main file, whenever you're done editing that video, you can, you can export it into smaller MP4, AVI, MOV, all of the other options are available from XDCAM. And finally, remember that just because there's no movement within the content of your finalized video, you can still add subtle movement uh, and adding like a soft, post-production pan or a zoom, uh, just to kind of enhance that a little bit. Yeah. I've got a 10-minute video. If anybody wants it, I'll give it to them right now. Speak now for an older piece, because i got to roll out to the GSG meeting. But uh, it, it does a pretty good job of kind of talking about what we've done here. In fact, that's where I got these video clips. Anybody want it? All right. I'll post a link up or something with, with the video. Okay? All right. Who wants to help me take this stuff back to my house?